Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre Open Day. I'm Dr Ben Mo. And my name is Dr Alejandra Sanchez Franks. And we're going to talk about the role of the oceans in our changing climate. So we have four themes that we're going to cover today. The first is the oceans, from looking at the very surface of the ocean to the deepest part, ocean currents to mechanisms that drive that ocean circulation, and we'll also talk about the role of oceans in our changing climate, the climate system in general, and the many key components of this system that allow us to observe that change. Another key question is, how do we observe that change in the ocean? So we cover here the many tools and instruments that we use in our field to observe the ocean and those changes. And this ranges from ships to robots to ROVs. We finally close on the topic of careers and career paths and find out what does it take to become an oceanographer? So with that, let's take it away with our first team, Ben. So I'm going to talk about the oceans. So first of all, I'm going to talk about our ocean, some facts about the ocean and really to show how it's important um, for our climate. I'll then to go, go on to talk about ocean currents and these we can talk about in terms of a wind driven circulation and also a density driven circulation. And when we think about density, we're thinking about cold water that's still salty and it's denser than the water around it. So it sinks down to the sea floor. And then we'll we'll look at life in the in the deep ocean down at the, the deep ocean floor. So our ocean, so why is our ocean important? Well, really, it, it is a blue planet. You know, water covers 71% of our planet's surface. So here you can see this Google image, and all the blue is, is ocean. And you can see deep trenches here in the Pacific, um, and there's mountain ranges here as well. Now the oceans, they, they actually produce 50% of our planet's oxygen. So 50% uh, of the oxygen or the air we breathe comes from photoplankton in the ocean. And the photoplankton is photosynthesis, just like we have on land. And the ocean, it, it, it feeds over three billion people. So all of those people are reliant on, on food from the ocean. So we need a healthy ocean to sustain, up, sustain our population. And also our global economy. So the goods you've got in your house, uh, they probably come by a ship. So to our oceans actually support 90% of the world trade. So how deep do you think the ocean is? So hopefully, or we, we will touch on that later in the talk. So now onto ocean currents. So let's, let's go on to this wind-driven circulation. So you see here on the right, we've taken uh, our, our, a map of our planet, we've just flattened it out. And what you can see here, is that well as the sun heats the uh, heats the planet and we've got a rotating planet what happens is we set up these wind systems and they circulate around in different directions in each in each hemisphere and these winds drive ocean currents so you can see that warm water is taken uh, polewards from the equator towards the colder regions and in return, you see these cooler currents returning back to the equator. And we call these ocean gyres. In here, if we go on to the left to this animation, so this is a mathematical simulation of the speed of, of these ocean currents. So here we're looking at Antarctica. You can see it's South America here, South Africa and Australia. And what you're looking at here really shows how busy the ocean is. You know, it's, it's never stop, never stops. It's continuously moving. You can see that eddies formed. Uh, there's lots of wiggles. And as the winds blow continuously around Antarctica, 
it drives drives these drives these currents. And between South America and Antarctica, there is a over 135 million cubic meters of water per second will go through that narrow gap. And interestingly here, at the bottom of South Africa, you see these large swirls, these large eddies that are coming up into the South Atlantic. Now, this isn't this, this, this math mathematical model having a, a bad day. You know, these are real. And these actually bring warm, salty water from the Indian Ocean uh, and take it into the South Atlantic. So now let's go on to think about these density driven currents. So here we have, uh, well, let's start in the in the Atlantic. We have these warm, salty surface waters that heads northwards and come up towards uh, Iceland uh, and Greenland. And as they head northwards in the Atlantic, that warm water loses some of its heat to the atmosphere. And there's also a bit of evaporation as well, so it gets slightly saltier. But when it arrives up here of, of um, Iceland and Greenland, it's actually denser, it's denser than the water around it, and it sinks down to the deep ocean and returns as this cool blue pathway that circles around Antarctica and then comes back up again in the, in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. So water that's trapped or goes down in this pathway, you know, it can take up to a thousand years to complete this pathway. So it doesn't just move water around, it moves heat. Also nutrients, which are important for life, and gases such as carbon dioxide, this CO2, and it moves it around the planet uh, and takes, uh, so for example, the, the carbon dioxide, this carbon, it takes it into the deep ocean and stores it and redistributes it, redistributes it around the planet. So we've been observing the strength of this circulation since 2004 in the North Atlantic. And we've done that between Africa and the Bahamas. And what we found is that the amount of heat transported is the same as one million power stations. So did you know that the largest waterfall on Earth is actually in the ocean? And it's over here between Iceland and Greenland, and it's called a Denmark Strait Overflow. So it's where these deep waters come down and then pour down into the deep ocean. So now onto our ocean floor. So this is some footage uh, by a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV. And this is filmed at 800 metres in the Wittard Canyon, which is southwest of Iceland. And what we can see here is there's deep water corals. I shall let the movie play, it's not long. But the Wittard Canyon itself starts at the shelf edge, which is about 200 metres down, and it goes down to the abyssal plain depth at 4,500 metres. And you can see there's, there's life down here and they're feeding on the strong currents uh, that go past. So there's a famous quote really that, and, and it's really true, you know, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about our ocean floor. We've only explored around 5% of the, of the deep ocean and that's because it's very hard uh, to explore it. We need these, these uh, vehicles like the ROV to get down there. And also, one thing you may not know is that the largest mountain range is actually on the ocean floor. So now let's go on to think about our climate. So we're going to talk about the oceans and its role in our climate and, and what, what is happening in the oceans and just we're going to think about what we can actually do about it. So the oceans and our climate. 
So this line here that you see, this black line, is from 1880 through to the present day. And here's some pointers, you know, Queen Victoria died in about 1901. This is the re region of World War II, 1939 to 45, uh, and the present day. So the black line is showing us what's happening to our temperature. So you can see in time, it's, in, it's rising, it's increasing. And it's now 1.2 degrees warmer than it was in 1880. So the question is really, is that down to the planet's sort of natural cycles, its natural variability, or is that down to us, you know, the human uh, drivers? And what this figure is showing is the cyan line, that this is the planet's natural variability, and that's very different to the black line. Uh, but also to note here on the planet's variability, these peaks, these drops, that, that corresponds to uh, volcanoes. So is it human? Well, it looks like it is. So you see this red line, it's very much like the black line. So it looks like it's down to us uh, burning fossil fuels uh, and putting CO2 into our atmosphere. So the ocean, I've touched on this a bit already, but the ocean has this ability to actually store and move uh, the heat and the carbon around. You know, this, this overturning circulation that I showed with the deep water going down, or the deep dense water going down into the, the deep ocean. But it, the ocean actually absorbs 93% of this excess heat, this, you know, the, man, uh, the anthropogenic heat, the, what we put in, uh, and 25% of the carbon dioxide. So, so really, it's 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 doing us a favour. It's it's taking the, the heat out of the atmosphere, but still, ocean uh, sorry, the atmospheric temperatures they're still rising. So the ocean helps a lot. It, it regulates our climate, but there are consequences, and we'll go on to that. So what is happening? So as the oceans warm, uh, the, the plants and animals there must, must adapt or die. So what we can see on the left here, this, this was once a, a coral reef. And you can see there's, there's no bright corals there at all uh, due to uh, sea surface temperatures increasing, uh, that we call coral bleaching, uh, and also the acidity of the ocean is changing. So I've touched on this as CO2 goes into the ocean, it's becoming more acidic. And so also it's not just the corals, but also the other animals, you know, if it becomes more acidic, then, you know, they'll be able to, uh, to make strong shells. And also as the oceans warm, they expand. And as the atmosphere uh, increases in temperature, the glaciers, uh, the ice will melt. And this causes sea level rise. And this is currently 3.3 millimetres per year. That, that's globally. But it might not sound a lot, but over time it's going to make a big difference. So what, what's going to happen within the UK and Europe? We may see in time, you know, stormy winters, and we may see more frequent heat waves during the summer. So what can we do? So I think you would all have already heard of these like three R's or four R's, but we can reduce, you know, we can reduce our use of fossil fuels. We can reduce our energy consumption, turning off lights at home that we, when we're not using them. And we can also save water. Reuse. We've there's been a lot of talk recently about straws, plastic straws. So we need to avoid these single use items. You know, if you've got a plastic bottle of water, keep using it. Don't throw it away, reuse it. And recycling as well. Tins, bottles, batteries, clothes. And finally, rethink. And I think this is possibly one of the most important ones. Consider how your actions actually impact the environment. 
you go go to the beach, uh, you, you go anywhere, take your litter home with you. And if you get involved in these sort of litter picking uh, exercises uh, with other people, uh, it's not just about picking litter off the beaches, it's, it's about picking litter up anywhere and everywhere you are, because ultimately uh, that rubbish will end up uh, in, in the oceans. So that's the end of the climate section. So I'll now pass you back to Ale, who will talk about ocean observing and careers. Thanks, Ben. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ocean observing system. For scientists to determine all the changes in the ocean and climate, as Ben has just been telling us about, we need to be constantly and consistently measuring the ocean. There are many ways we do this. Um, ships allow us to do multidisciplinary research expeditions, ocean robots which operate autonomously, satellites that measure the ocean surface remotely, and finally, vehicles that can survey the ocean floor. The NOC runs two research vessels, or ships, the James Cook and the Discovery. Both are very similar in terms of function, capacity, size. So you can see in this slide here, there's a video of some drone footage of the James Cook, which is about 90 meters in length and 90 meters wide and averages a speed of about 10 knots, which is a little bit on the slow side. It can also house about 54 people for about 50 days. This group of people typically consists of crew, officers, and a team of scientists. The type of research expeditions that we run from the NOC effectively go from pole to pole. This means that we run research expeditions in the Arctic, the subpolar oceans, the subtropical, the tropics, and then um, all the way down to the Antarctic. There's many different types of ocean properties that can be measured and are measured by research expeditions. But the ocean observing group that Ben and I are a part of usually focuses on physical properties such as pressure, temperature, salinity, velocity, and biogeochemical properties like oxygen and carbon. Another thing that's really important to note is that our ships are designed to have low impact as possible on the environment. This means low noise, low waste, and low sulfur diesel. The point of this is to minimize as much as possible any damage to the surrounding environment and the ecosystems. So what's it like being at sea? It can be very exhilarating and very intense. The ships normally run on 24 hour schedule. This means science never sleep. There's always someone on shift either collecting samples on deck or in the lab analyzing samples. And in our spare time, when we get any, we might get together to watch movies in the lounge or do some exercises in the gym, or even just hang out on the aft deck watching a sunset or a sunrise. The next key component of our ocean observing system are ocean robots. What we mean by this is instruments that operate autonomously. So for example, you can give them a program, deploy them in the ocean, and then they will execute that program for as long as they're told to, or for as long as they have battery. The two most common ones we use at the NOC are Argopos and gliders, which are very similar. You're gonna hear more about gliders later today, so I'll focus here on the Argo floats. An Argo float effectively looks like this little yellow cylinder that you see here in the picture on the upper left. Uh, but don't let that deceive you. It's an Argo float is a little bit over a meter tall and weighs about 25 kilograms. So we typically deploy Argo floats from ships and then they are designed to profile the surface of the ocean to a depth of 2000 meters. The way that they're designed to work is that once you deploy them from a ship, they typically dive to about a thousand meters. They sleep there for about nine days to conserve energy. And this is a standard Argo float I'm talking about. And then on the 10th day, they will dive to 2000 meters and begin an ascent, which begins its profile all the way from the 2000 meter mark to the ocean surface. And in those 2000 meters, the parameter typically measures our pressure, salinity, and temperature. Once it gets to the surface, the float transmits its data by satellite to us before then diving again and getting its next profile. In this map to the lower left, you can see how many Argo floats have been deployed in the ocean. As you can see, it's almost 4,000. And all of these have contributed critically to our ability to detect and describe ocean heating. 
So there's in recent history been two extensions of the Argo Flow program. The first is the Deep Argo. Deep Argo floats are designed a little bit differently to the standard Argo floats so that they can withstand pressures of up to 6,000 meters. And they have completely revolutionized our understanding of deep ocean circulation. The other extension to the program is the biogeochemical Argo float, which also measures properties such as oxygen, carbon, and fluorescence. And the reason that this is important is because it's critical for us to understand processes like ocean deoxygenation and acidification. So what do you guys think it's like in the deep ocean? It's cold, it's dark, and there's an enormous amount of pressure. When we design any of these instruments to survey the ocean floor or deeper depths, we have to keep all of these things in mind so that the instruments and the very delicate sensors can withstand all these conditions and then transmit the data back to us. Next on our list is satellites. Satellites are constantly orbiting the planet and they gave us extremely high resolution coverage over the entire surface of our globe. So whereas you can think of the data that we get from the ships or the autonomous vehicles as these sort of very localized pieces of information, satellites are fantastic in, the, in that they give us um, a sort of surface survey of the global ocean. And there are many different types of satellites, but the ones that are important to oceanography typically measure the surface wind, sea surface height, sea surface temperature and salinity, and surface velocity. As you can see from this video, you can observe in real time from satellite data just how much ocean temperature is changing. You can see just how warm it is at the tropics and then it cools towards the poles. You can also see other parameters we measure, such as chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is important for us to understand surface biological productivity, which is in turn important for fisheries and the general health of the ocean's ecosystems. So the last stop on this ocean observing tour is the ocean floor. In the previous themes, Ben showed us some footage of the ROV, which is a remotely operated vehicle. In this video, you can see what that ROV looks like. It is typically deployed from a ship, descends to the ocean floor, where it has two arms that can be used to take ocean floor samples. And it also has a large host of cameras that can be used to monitor the ocean floor as well. You can see up on these screens uh, the sort of footage that you might get from an RV. Complex computer algorithms take this information from the ca cameras and translate it into um, meaningful data for us, which is important in our ocean observing systems. Another interesting note is that the ROV that we have at the NOC is one of the deepest ones that exists in the world and measures up to 6,500 meters. Finally, let's move on to careers. Oceanography is a very diverse, but it's also a very new field. A lot of people that have come into oceanography have a very wide range of backgrounds. For example, mathematicians, physicists, chemists, biologists, geologists, computer programmers, engineers, and technicians. If you're someone that wants to become a scientist and to specifically answer research questions, usually it's standard to do a PhD. And again, it can be in the field of oceanography or any of these oceanography related fields as we've listed them here above. To give you an example of some diversity in our career paths, I'll tell you a little bit about mine. I'm originally from Mexico. I was born and raised there, but when I turned 18, I decided to go live in Canada and to get a bachelor's in applied mathematics. From there, I traveled to the United States and did a PhD in marine and atmospheric science before I finally came to the UK and got a job at the National Oceanography Center. But there are other types of backgrounds. Um, for example, Ben, why don't you tell us a little bit about yours? So I, I also have a degree in uh, mathematics and then I went on to do a part time PhD um, with the University of Southampton. And this was aligned with the work I was actually doing at the Oceanography Centre. Uh, so my, my PhD was actually in uh, the School of Engineering within within the university. 
and I've been at NOC uh, since about 1995. That's great. Thanks, Ben. So the NOC is continuously training the next generations of scientists, and we really hope that this talk both motivates and inspires you to join us in the fight for trying to understand and save our oceans. Thank you. Thank you very much.